Good morning, church. We are so excited this Independence Day. It is going to be such a great day. We encourage you to share this live stream with all of your Facebook friends. Leave a comment down below. Say good morning, church, or whatever you would like. It's going to be such a great day, and we can't wait to hear from Pastor Connor. Also, we are having communion during this worship experience, so gather your family and your sacraments and be ready to remember the sacrifice that Jesus made long ago. Let's get ready to worship. Good morning, church. We want to praise God this morning. Let's worship Him this morning with everything.
Hey, what an amazing time we are having worshiping God together this morning. We're going to continue to worship God as we take communion together. We do this every week, but I don't want it to become just uh, the norm or us to take it for granted. This is something special we do. Jesus actually asked us to take communion and do it in remembrance of Him. So this is part of our worship because in worship, we set our minds on God. We set our minds on our Father. We set our minds on Jesus and who He is. We take our minds off of self and set them upon Jesus Christ. So today as you're there uh, and you're watching online and you have your communion sacraments, that that means your, your bread which represents His body, 
and the juice, which, which represents his blood. As you have those there together, I want you to do it as an act of worship. And I want you to do it setting your mind upon Jesus Christ. So I'm going to pray today. And then as I pray, I just would encourage you right there together with your family. Take communion and remember all that Jesus has done and all that Jesus is. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to worship you by remembering who you are. So today as we take communion, as we take the bread, and as we take the juice, let our minds be set upon you, not on ourselves, but upon you and on the sacrifice that you made for us. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Take communion this morning. Summit Church. We're so glad that you're with us today. It's the 4th of July. You're joining us for church. 
Uh, no better way I could think uh, on the 4th of July to spend your time than just being in the presence of God uh, for a few hours. And we hope you've enjoyed worship up to this time. And if you're new with us today, you can see below on the screen of how to get connected with us. And we're all about meeting new people. We're all about building relationship here at Summit. Uh, there's no outsiders here. There's a place for anyone and everyone here uh, to be a part. And we're so thankful uh, that you're joining us online today. Uh, it's the 4th of July. Happy Independence Day. I hope you've had a great weekend. I hope you've had fun, uh, you know, maybe popping some fireworks or eating some food with your family, just relaxing by the pool, whatever you've been doing. Uh, you know, you know, happy Independence Day to you. And I hope you had a great weekend. But today we're going to dive right into the Word of God. I'm so excited to share with you this message today entitled Fight for Your Family. Fight for Your Family. Today it's, it's about freedom. You know, we, we have the freedoms we have because of so many people going before us and fighting before us. And, and today, I want to encourage you to keep that grit about you uh, by fighting for your family in the, in the place of prayer, uh, making God present in your home and blazing a trail for your family. Let's read our main text together. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 14. This is what it says. You can see it on the screen below. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles, to the leaders, and to the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. He's talking about the enemy here. Do not be afraid of the enemy. Remember the Lord, great and awesome, and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. If we put that in today's vernacular, fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wife, singular, and your houses. Because uh, back in that day, they had uh, multiple wives in the Old Testament. That's not how we roll anymore. Uh, Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 20 it says, wherever you hear the sound of a trumpet, rally to us there. Our God will fight for us. Uh, main point of today, if you will fight for your family, God will fight for you. If you will fight for your family, God will fight for you. It's evident in these scriptures in Nehemiah 4.14 and Nehemiah 4.20. Let's pray. God, we come to you today. We're so thankful for your word. God, that it changes us. It renews our mind. God, I pray that something fresh would come up within us today. Bring us new revelation, God, that pushes us into change on your behalf. God, we want to serve your kingdom. We want to love you, and we thank you today for who you are. It's in his name we pray, everybody said. Amen. Amen. Today, we're talking about fight for your family. Fight for your family. You know, in Nehemiah's day... In this day and age, Nehemiah was called of God to rebuild the walls around Jerusalem. These walls representing the glory of God, representing God's protection and his praises. Physically, the walls in this day were down. But in our day, our walls are down in a different way, spiritually, morally, and within the family. There is such an attack right now against the family in America. It's outstanding to see how the enemy is trying to divide and conquer uh, within marriages, within relationships with kids, uh, where mothers and fathers aren't even with each other in the home. It's single parent households. It's uh, we're confused about uh, gender. We're confused about sexual orientation, all these things. The enemy is dividing and conquering. And I really believe that through this series, as Pastor David's been preaching, as we've been hearing the messages that have preceded this one, that God wants us to repent, rebuild, and restore what has been lost. See, we can't let fear overrule us in this day and age. There's a propensity now. I've talked to so many couples that are around my age and even younger that are coming into marriage wondering if they should even have kids. They're scared to death of raising their kids in this climate that we're in uh, of the world, of the spiritual climate and the moral climate. And I would say to them, do not be afraid. God will cover us. No weapon formed against us will prosper. There's, gonna, there's hope. There are, there will always be hope. God can, God can strengthen us and, and empower us to live for him no matter where we are. Is it going to be easy all the time? Absolutely not. God never said it would be easy, but he always promised to be with us and he always promised to cover us. No weapon formed against you will prosper. God is with you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Do not be depressed. God fights for us. Today, we're going to be talking about rebuilding some of these walls within our homes. 
We're, we're so thankful that Nehemiah gives us the example of what it looks like to rise up within the purpose of God through courage, bravery, leadership. And these things caused him to inspire a group of people to rise up and accomplish something that is still standing today. I would ask, what walls are you building within your family? What walls am I building? Am I building walls that my kids can, can see spiritually and morally and, and in my marriage with my wife, in our relationship with one another, with my kids and with my wife, that they can go to and say, man, dad always prayed for us. Every time we would wake up, we could hear dad praying. Every time he left the house, he always prayed for us. Every time, almost every night before we went to bed, dad always prayed. We were always professing the word of God. We were always singing praises to God. See, if you want to fight for your family, many times it's within the elementary things in our walk with God. And when I say elementary, I don't mean things that are, um, you know, nonchalant or, you know, prayer's a good thing to do. Not like that. I'm saying, I'm saying prayer in the sense of this, that spiritual maturity is the consistent application of elementary principles. That's a quote from uh, Damon Thompson, one of, one of my favorite speakers and uh, a man that I've looked up to for a long time. That spiritual maturity is the consistent application of elementary principles. So when we say elementary, that doesn't mean that we've gotten too good to do those things or we're too, too far along to be one that turns on that worship music and, and prays every day. You know, I've been saved for a long time. I don't need to do that. See, when we come into a place of spiritual maturity, it's not us becoming independent of God. It's us becoming more dependent upon God. That's how this thing works. It's not us just walking to and fro through the spiritual life, hoping someday when God is going to bring about his purpose in our life. It's us actively pursuing the things of God, actively pursuing what he wants for our lives. This is what God wants to do. And I'm thankful that Nehemiah came out of the place of comfort, notoriety, as we've learned through the messages previously, being the cupbearer of the king, doing anything he wanted to do within the nation, and that gave him favor. He had favor in the eyes of the king, so he was able to do what God wanted him to do. He stepped out of the place of comfort to serve God's purpose. What walls are you building for your family? Walls of praise, prayer? Are you building walls of providence and generosity? People still go to the walls that Nehemiah built today to pray. All because a man inspired by God chose to take a stand. What could one decision in your life do for all those that you affect around you? What could it do? What could it do for your kids, for your spouse? If you chose to pray every day this year, if you said, man, I haven't been consistent in prayer, I'm gonna pray, I'm gonna pray once a day, Every day, I'm going to wake up in the morning, I'm going to spend 30 minutes to an hour with God. How would that change your life? If you chose to read the Word, at one point of every day, I'm going to read the Word, build my relationship with God. You don't think your kids are watching? You don't think your spouse is watching? Dad, mom, son, daughter, you have a circle of influence around you, and there are people always watching how you live your life. I can remember when I first dedicated my life to God, it was as if I had a microscope on me. I could literally feel the eyes on me. Man, how does Connor act when this happens? How does that, how does that work? How's that? It's not about me. It's about the God in me. They're seeing that I'm acting different. They see that when troubles come, I, I'm throwing out scripture. You know, that happened, but that's okay. God's with us. You know, no weapon formed against us will prosper. You know, my God is a friend that sticks closer than a brother, and I know it's hard right now, but he's going to bring us through this. See, when we have this language in our mouth, when we have this attitude in our mind, when we walk this out in our lives, everybody's watching, and it can make a difference. It's a literal ripple effect around you. People still go to Nehemiah's wall because he chose to repent, rebuild, and restore these things happened. See, the family dynamic is so important, not only in our spiritual walk, but in our nation, in our world. You know, a nation is only as strong as the families that make up that nation. And right now, families are broken down in our nation. It's no news to anybody that families are broken down. You can look anywhere. You can look anywhere. You know, single parent households. Uh, kids 
in people that are struggling to even know their own identity, even know their own makeup within their life. Uh, so many things that are just the enemy has come in and deceived and manipulated and distorted and deceived and, and, and all of these things, dividing and conquering within these areas. And God wants to use people of God that, to come in and to rebuild these walls. I believe the devil would love nothing more than to bust your marriage up, your relationship with your kids and your entire life up. That's his goal, to steal, kill, and destroy that is his role in this earth. And the devil's not, you know, in hell shoveling coal right now. He's a prince of the power of the air. He has an army of, of, of minions called demons that are trying to do everything they can to get you to trip up and not follow in the way that God wants you to go. So if there is an army and there, there is this, this person or this, this entity called the devil trying to attack us, and he sees that the family is so important, he's going to divide and conquer it. How much more should we, that are people of God, put it as our main priority and focus? See, if our family units are not strong, the church will not be strong. If the church is not strong, then there's no backbone to our nation. It all starts, it all ends with the family. We have to have a strong foundation for all of these things to work properly. The family unit being divided and conquered is of the highest priority of the devil. And if he sees it as his pri highest priority, we better begin to view it the same. We shouldn't be ignorant of his devices. He understands your marriage is a costly commitment. He understands that fatherhood and motherhood is a costly commitment. These are things that we are committing ourselves to, to, to see God work within. And when opposition comes, let me tell you something. As soon as you begin to step out for God, most of the time I found out in my life and those around me, opposition is right around the corner. It, it just is a part of it. it there, there's no way of getting around it. But when you come face to face with that opposition, you have the creator of the universe, you have the, the one, the, we win in this situation. We win the war, but there are little battles that happen and you have the God of the universe on your side. And when you are in relationship with him, when you are understanding that he's your father, he's a faithful father, he is right there with you, then there's nothing that can harm you, can come against you, that you cannot overcome. This is what the word says, take courage for I Jesus, God speaking here, have overcome the world. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Another scripture. The same spirit that rose Christ from the dead lives within my body. I have resurrection power within my body. Are you kidding me? And I am going to be afraid of the devil? Are you crazy? I have got Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, God, fighting on my behalf. There is nothing that can hold me back. Until God's purpose is done within my life and within your life, there's no devil in hell that can stop us. Do not be ignorant of the devil's devices, but do not be ignorant of the one that wants to fight on your behalf. Do not be aloof at what God wants to do in your life. Be close to him. Fatherhood, motherhood, being a husband and a wife, it's a costly commitment. Fighting for your family, costly commitment. I love how this plays out in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, in the life of Noah. If you're unaware of Noah, Noah uh, uh, <clears throat> was a great man in the Old Testament that when God looked upon the earth, he couldn't find one that was righteous, couldn't find one that was holy, living right in his sight, except for Noah and his family. And so he calls Noah, build an ark, build this gigantic boat that's going to save you, your family, and two of every animal on the earth, it's going to save you guys, and I want you to build this. Noah's obedience put his family in the place of protection. Noah builds this ark, and I can imagine that last day, as 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5 says, uh, God saved Noah, the eighth one of them. So there was eight of them. Noah had six children, a wife, and then he had himself. There was eight of them. And I can imagine Noah sitting around in a circle. Every animal, every insect, all the things are on the ark. And he's counting his family, making sure, hey, he's in there. He's in there. She's in there. She's in there. Counting this up. And 
when he gets to the last numbers, he realizes that all of his family is on the boat. They are all saved. They are all safe. And Noah is the last one to follow them in. He is the last one of eight. He is literally fighting for his family by being the protector, understanding and knowing that if my family doesn't get on this boat, they are not being saved. I would say today, we have to take this same posture that Noah has taken. We have to be those that put our families in alignment to be in the purpose and will of God. Now, sure, I'm, it was surely the decision of his kids and his wife to get on the boat with him. But Noah put his family in the position to be safe. Scripture is specific that he was the eighth one, signifying uh, salvation, signifying new beginnings. And I can imagine him getting them ready as we talked about so that when judgment came, when the flood came and the door was shut to the ark, that they were carried by the boat. The grace of God carried them on top of judgment and they were not subject to it. This is a type and shadow of the end times uh, of the rapture that when God comes back, are our families going to be within the family of God? Are they going to be those that are against it? See, we are literally setting the trajectory for those that will come after us. You can see this time and time again in the word of God that if you are one that will fight for your family, if you are one that will blaze the trail for your family, that God's blessing will cover them. I, I am literally a testimony of that truth right there. Noah and his family were safe because he chose to fight for his family. Dad, mom, uh, son, daughter, don't leave it up to someone else to fight for your family. Be the one that comes to the forefront. Be the one that is going to follow after God. Fighting your family looks like these three things that I'm going to share with you today. Joshua chapter 24 verse, 14, or verse 15 says, But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. But as for me and my house, Joshua is making a stand. In the middle of deception, uh, deceiving times, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. The number one thing I could tell you is to fight in the place of prayer. Declare the word of God over and to your family. Do not sit idly by and wait for us as pastors. We love to declare the word over your family. We love to pray for them. We do it all the time. But in your home, you should be the leader Raise, rise up, pray, rise up, get into a place of worship and say just as Joshua did, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Job chapter one, verse five says this, Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning. I love that, rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. This Job did continually. Job had 10 children and his wife. And this is letting us know in Job chapter 1 that he did this continually. He rose up early in the morning and he brought before his sons and he brought before his wife and his children to God and blessed them. It, this, would be, uh, this would be something like this in our vernacular today. Me bringing Lindley, my daughter, before God. God, I pray that Lindley would walk in the will and purpose of you for all her days. I pray that any enemy or weapon that is formed against her wouldn't prosper. God, let love uh, be behind everything and before everything she does. Let your grace, your will, and your purpose follow her for all her days. It's me covering my family in the word of God. It's me speaking it to them. Let your kids hear you speaking the word of God. This is not a secret to be kept. This is something to share. When they look back, just as we asked earlier, what walls are you building for your family? Are they going to be able to go see the wall that dad built that he prayed all the time? He worshiped when times were tough. When there wasn't even enough money to cover bills at the end of the month, he still gave and was generous, and he still poured his life out as an offering to God. Cover your family in the blood of Christ. Cover them in prayer and watch God protect them. This is what it's telling us in Nehemiah 4.14 and Nehemiah 4.20 that if we will fight for our families, God will fight for us. We see here in 2 Kings chapter 10, verse 7, uh, this is Jezebel's family. Her and her, her husband, King Ahab, this is their family. This is a family that's wrought with wickedness. Jezebel, I mean, she was just terrible. If you read about her, I mean, she was just the scum of the earth, always coming against the plan of God, just 
just a terrible woman, deceptive. And this is what it says. So it was when the letter came to them that they took the king's sons and slaughtered 70 persons, put their heads in baskets and sent them to him at Jezreel. Their whole family got wiped out. They're, they're sitting here walking in wickedness. They made themselves subject to the enemy's devices. Now, you would say, man, I'm not making my family subject to that. But when we don't fight for our families, see, as we've talked about, the enemy's role is to still kill and destroy. He's trying to divide and conquer within your family, within your marriage, within your relationship with your kids. He's looking for any little thing to bust that thing up. And we don't want to see that happen. But we have to take intentional steps of allowing God to cover us and to be with us in these moments of need. Then we see again in 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 11. I believe this is the only other family in the Bible that has the same amount of number of family members, 70, just as Jezebel's family. And this is a family that was covered in the presence of God in the home. And generational blessing followed this family. This is what it says. The ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, three months, and the Lord blessed Obed-Edom in all his household. Obed-Edom's family from generation to generation, served within the kingdom because he made the presence of God a priority in the home. Prayer, cover them in prayer. Fight for your family. The Bible says that if you raise a child in a way they should go, when they are old, they will not depart. I know so many great men of God that I know they have raised their children right, but they still depart. But there is a promise knowing that God will keep them until their day of salvation. There's a promise knowing that God has covered them. Every time you read the word, every time you utter a prayer, every time you bring your kids and your family to church, you are fighting for your family. Fight for your family. In Philemon chapter 1 verse 2, Paul is writing to this church. And we see here at the end of that scripture, into the church and your house into the church in your house. That's significant. Paul's usually writing to the church at Corinth or Thessalonica or to the church in Rome, but he uh, specifies that this church was in this person's house. My second point, make God present in your home. Make him present in your home. Prayer is a way to do that. But this, this point is significant because we could, I could see myself doing this and I could see us saying, God is in my home. He's everywhere. He's omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent. He's everywhere. He's within everything, knows everything. God's in my home. But what I would say to you, are you making him present in your home? Are you reminding your wife, your kids, wives, are you reminding your husbands that God came through for us. Do you remember how God came through? Do you remember when our kid was sick and we prayed? Do you remember how when our kid was sick and the church rallied around us? Do you remember how when our marriage was busted up that, that pastor so-and-so reached out or our friend from our small group reached out? See, when we bring back to remembrance and we begin to magnify the Lord and how the Lord works within the, the earth, which is the church and the people of the church, when we remind ourselves and magnify these things and put them into proper perspective, the possibility Possibilities are endless. We must make God present in our home. Because let me tell you something. The enemy is trying to make so many other things present in your home. Uh, the things your kids are watching. Things are geared for us to slip up. Uh, when we're on our phones, there are so many devices the enemy is trying to use to slip us up in our relationship with God. And I would say fight for your family by making God present in your home. Romans chapter 12 verse 1 and 2 says... In the message translation. So here's what I want you to do. I love this translation. Here's what I want you to do. So specific. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for Him. You're saying, I can do something for God to make his blessing more accessible to myself and to make his favor more accessible to myself? Yes, embrace what God does for you, and that's the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without thinking. Instead, fix your eyes on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond that's so important unlike the culture around you always bringing you down to its level of immaturity 
God brings the best out of you and develops well-formed maturity in you. Make God present in your home. God is everywhere, but he is not magnified everywhere. In the church in West Texas, I have grown up here my whole life, and it's so easy because I've done this myself. It's so easy for us to buy a few scripture uh, decor to hang on our wall, to have a Bible, maybe a couple James Dobson books, maybe a couple of good books that we read, and we just stamp our Christianity on that, and we say, now that I've, I'm a mature Christian, I'm independent of God, when in actuality, spiritual maturity is becoming more dependent on God. We have to get into the habit of making ourselves uncomfortable, stoking the fires again of our relationship with God so that the fires and the embers don't die down. We must press in. We must be those that take Romans 12 and make it a mantra of our life. Make God present in your home. Make him present in your home. Number three, fight by blazing a trail for your family. Fight by blazing a trail for your family. There's a story told of a famous attorney in the Northwest that on his way to work every day, he would work, he would walk to work. He lived so close to his, to his practice. He would walk to work and he would slip into this bar right before he would go to work and he would get a drink. Uh, every day he went to work over and over again, slip in, get a drink, go to work, slip in, get a drink, go to work. One day, snow comes. It's terrible, terrible snowstorm. And he kisses his son goodbye, kisses his wife goodbye, and he's going to work. Well, of course, he slips by the bar again, and he wants to get a drink. On his way to the bar, when he gets to the door of the bar, he senses that someone's been following him this whole time. This this one time on his way to work, he's done this so many times over and over again. But this one time, he senses somebody behind him. And so he turns around and looks and he sees his son walking in his footprints that were made in the snow, exactly taking each step one by one in these footprints. The conviction of God hits his heart. He grabs his son, runs home, puts him back to bed. Uh, He tells his wife by, tells her what happened, keep an eye on our kid. And he goes downstairs and he breaks down. He breaks down and he says, God, I pray that my footsteps never lead my son to a bar for answers again, but my footsteps would only lead him to you. My question today to end this message, closing with this, where is your trail leading those that precede you? Where are your footsteps leading them? You are leaving a trail. You're leaving a trail. It reminds me of Scooby-Doo. When Scooby-Doo is walking around, and, and, and all those episodes, he's got his snacks. He doesn't realize he's leaving a trail for the enemy right behind him. Everywhere he goes, he does it all the time. But many times we're doing that with our kids. We're leaving a trail to a place that's going to lead them to destruction. And I'm telling you, you can set a trajectory for your kids, for those around you, for your friends, for your family, to see what you're doing is going towards God and you're building the wall that God wants you to build or you're tearing it down. Are we going to be building or are we going to be tearing down? Where are our footsteps leading those that precede us? Leave a set of steps that will guide your kids, your family, your spouse, those around you into the presence of God, into healthy decision making, into courage for the things of God, into boldness, into love for others, and into godliness. Where do your footprints lead those preceding you? I remember when my great-grandmother died uh, three or four years ago and me and Taylor had just got married uh, maybe a couple years before that. And uh, me and my brothers and my dad and my grandma go to see my great grandmother. She is on her deathbed. And this is a woman that is just a pillar of faith in our family. She's, every time I was around her, she told me how she was praying for me and what she saw God doing in my life. And, and all these things, my granny was the same way. And we're sitting in that room 
And I can just imagine what she was thanking in her mind as she was thanking God because of the trail that she blazed, that her family was saved, that she could rest assured knowing that my grandmother was saved and my dad was saved and my brothers were saved and I was saved and I was in the ministry. I can't tell you how many times she would pray over us that God was going to do something big in our lives and that that we were going to preach and we're going to do these things as, as a grand... She's, just our biggest champion you know how grandmas are but she would just pray for us all the time and because she would prophesy this I really do believe she blazed a trail for our families and there were generations represented in that room that she didn't even see that Lindley our daughter was to come and my brother's kids Stone and Rowan were to come that five generations were affected because of the faith in the trail that was blazed by one woman what could one pillar decision do for your family Choosing to be a person of prayer, choosing to be a person of worship, that every time the doors are open, that your family doesn't have to question if you're going to church that Sunday. They know. They're already getting ready. I can remember when I was growing up, I would I would get sick and I'd want to play hooky from church. I do this all the time. And my dad would come and, I, and I'd say, Dad, I need to go to the doctor, you know. I, I'm just feeling bad. And he said, church is the best place you could be if you were sick. Now, there are certain... Uh, you know, times where you do need to go to the doctor, of course, but he knew I was fibbing. And it, what, what, what it brought back to remembrance to me was I never had to question where my dad's intentions were on a Sunday morning. It was a pillar set. We're going to church. Mom, we're going to church. They tell us all the time, we're going to church. It's important. And so that is something that was ingrained in my mind. Do your kids, I know this is a, this is a convicting question. Do your kids have to wake up and wonder, are we going to church today? Are we going to church? Is that something we're doing right now at this time of year? Or are we doing other things? See, I'm so thankful for online church. I'm so thankful you're watching today. It's, it's an awesome avenue. And if you cannot be in person, that's awesome. More power to you. So thankful that the presence of God, he can meet you wherever you are. But being in the presence of other believers, being built up, admonished, encouraged, that's where God wants us to be if we are able. If we're able to be in the house, be in the house. My grandmother left a trail for us. And as we were sitting in that room, uh, I began to sing a song that I wrote um, and the whole, I mean, the spirit of God fell. Everybody's bawling. But the, the lyrics of that song, freedom has come, love has won. Fear has been outdone by perfect love. The fear of God never held my grandmother's back from praying for us. They went through hard times. There, there were many times they would tell stories of how they've, they almost died. How they would pray and tornadoes would go over their house and then drop back down on the other side. Miracle after miracle, story after story. And that's how I know that God's miraculous because of the trail that she blazed. There is a old children's church song that we all used to sing or we have all heard. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you hear, what you say, what you do, and where you go. I would, I would change that around. If, if I was to switch that around today, I would say, be careful, big eyes, what you see. Be careful, big ears, what you hear. Be careful, big mouth, what you say. As a pastor, Jensen Franklin says, where the big eyes go, the little eyes will follow. Everything you're doing in your life is being examined. It's being examined by somebody in your circle of influence. No matter what it is you're doing right now, how you act, how you talk, if you're a person of prayer, if you're a person of worship, if you, if you have habits and patterns of living morally right or morally wrong, People are watching your life. And you say, well, why is that important? I can just do what I want. It doesn't matter what people think. I'm telling you, it matters. Because somebody is following in your footsteps. Could be your family. They're definitely following in your footsteps. Could be your spouse looking to you for leadership. There is somebody right now in your life counting on you to be walking in the purpose, in the plan of God. Be careful, big eyes what you see because where the big eyes go the little eyes will follow I'm telling you when you hear this I don't want you to take on this attitude man this is an insurmountable task how could I do this uh, maybe you're newly saved or you don't even know who God is or you're not even sure where to go in this faith journey I'm telling you today the best first step you could take 
is by acknowledging the Lordship of Jesus, acknowledging Him in who He is. Don't give up. Romans 5.20 says, Where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. God's grace, His divine empowerment, can empower you to repent, rebuild, and restore. If you have something in your life you need to repent of today, I would encourage you to do that. If you have something in your life you need to help by the will of God to rebuild, I would encourage you to rebuild that. And if you need restoration, call out to the one who can restore you today. And his name is Jesus Christ. We do not serve a high priest who does not empathize with our weakness. He understands where we're coming from. God sent his son Jesus Christ to get within the mess, to change it not from the outside in as in the Old Testament, from, but from the inside out. That's how God wants to change you today. He wants to get within the inside of who you are and transform you to make you white as snow. The Bible says, though your sins were as scarlet, you have been washed white as snow. Let the blood of Christ wash over you today to help you be the one and be the ones who are like Nehemiah where you can fight for your family, where you can fight for those you love. We're going to end with this. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 14, what we began with. And I looked around and I rose and said to the nobles, to the leaders, and to the rest of the people, do not be afraid. I'm telling you today, do not be afraid to fight for your family. Remember the Lord great and awesome and fight for your brothers your sons your daughters your wife and your houses do not be afraid because wherever you hear the sound of a trumpet wherever you hear the sound of worship rally to us there our god will fight for us i'm gonna leave you with this today if you will fight for your family if you will choose by god to fight for your family today god will fight for you god will fight for you Man, what a great word today. Hey, if you made a decision to follow Christ, we are so excited for you. It's the best decision you could ever make. And your next steps will be coming on the slide below so we can help you with that and help you along your journey. Also, to stay connected here at Summit, we want you to go and follow our Facebook and Instagram social medias and go to our website, yoursummitchurch.com. Oh, man, I'm so excited, man. What a great word that God's given us today, and I hope that really gets in your heart. Listen, I want to encourage you to continue to be a giver. Thank you so much for your generosity. Thank you so much for being a part. Now, I want to just speak to something that you may be feeling right now. If you're a person who's church online and you're watching from another location or maybe you're shut in and you can't get out and you're not coming in person, if you're a part of our church online campus, I want you to understand that that can feel disconnected, but we don't want you to be disconnected. And one of the ways that you can connect yourself with the relationship of your church is to be a giver, to be a server, and to be connected in all ways to what God is doing in that house. I want to encourage you today, if you haven't stepped into giving, you see the simple, safe, and secure ways to give right there in the instructions, and I want to encourage you to do it. Don't don't just sit back and watch and be an observer. Be a participator in the kingdom because God is using us to do some great things in this earth, to do some great things in this city, to do some great things as a ministry called Summit Church, and we need you to be involved in that. So I want to encourage you, don't sit back, but participate. Set your faith. Connect your faith to the, the ministry that's coming to you. And you say, well, you know, it's just on church online. I don't really come to church. Well, listen, you're receiving spiritually from this. And the Bible says when we receive spiritually from something, we should give, we should remunerate financially to that. And that's a principle of the word of God. And, and that's something we should do. So I want to encourage you. Some of you are already giving and we thank you so much for your generosity. But if you haven't made that step yet, I want to encourage you be a giver because it will change your life. Here at Summit, one of our values is generosity. Generosity in all things, our time, our talent, and our treasure. I would encourage you to participate in all of that. In Jesus' name. So thank you for giving. Hey, I want to take an opportunity to bless you. And I know we do this every week, and sometimes it may feel just like a routine thing we do, but I want you to understand when I declare it, 
I am not just blessing you some words so that you'll feel blessed. I am taking the words, this priestly blessing from the book of Numbers, and I am declaring it over you in faith, believing that God will do this for your life this week. So if you just hold your hands out if to receive a blessing, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to speak that blessing over you right now. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his countenance towards you approvingly and give you peace. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, amen, amen. Have a great week, and we'll see you back next Sunday. God bless you.